everyone and welcome to the Face Library Podcast. This is Aaron and I want to say thank you all for supporting us by liking on Facebook and also subscribing to our YouTube channel which is Faith Library PH. We will be uploading uh, our videos uh, very, very soon. Uh, we only post our premiere on Facebook for now. Uh, that's every Wednesday at 8 p.m. I want to say thank you for uh, all being supportive by liking us and sharing our posts. I hope you shared our posts uh, a while ago and also on Monday. For tonight, we will be having a wonderful guest. Uh, but, but before that, uh, you can watch our last episode with Joel Sedekes about God, evil, and suffering. And Joel Sedekes is part of the Think Institute. And may, you can also check them out on Facebook. And tonight, we'll be having a wonderful guest and a wonderful topic, which is the Westminster Confession of Faith. And before we start, I will just give uh, credentials to our guest. He's born in Melbourne. Dr. Roland Ward was in the business world for 10 years, laterally as a senior account executive with Marsh, the international insurance brokers. He studied for the ministry at the Free Church of Scotland College, now Edinburgh Theological Seminary, from 1972 and 19, to 1975, and has served as a parish minister for 40 years with the Presbyterian Church of Eastern Australia, which is a small, strict subscription denomination, mostly in Melbourne, until retirement in 1996. He continues to preach most weeks in his research and church history lecture at the Presbyterian Theological College in Melbourne. He is married to Anna and they have five adult children and nine grandchildren. Let us all welcome Dr. Reverend Dr. Roland Ward. Welcome to the show, Reverend. Well, I'm glad to be with you. I might have given you the wrong information. I retired in 2012, oh. not 1996. <laughs> I still oh. retired then, but I retired in 2012 so I could help out without having to take a pay. So, uh, and to do other things. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm pleased to be with you today. Hello, Reverend. So yeah, it's a uh, year in 2012. <laughs> now that information is good. Now, uh, Reverend Roland Ward, uh, since uh, your introduction is so uh, is self-explanatory, uh, uh, I just want to ask, how's the situation there in Australia? Uh, how are you in Melbourne and everything? What's going on? Well, Melbourne's the capital of the state of Victoria which has about 25% of the population of Australia. Total population of Australia is 25 million. Um, but we are in serious lockdown, much more so than the other states. Unfortunately, some mistakes were made and one way or another, we had an outbreaking of the uh, coronavirus quite seriously from some of the um, quarantine places that uh, overseas returnees had gone to for their two weeks quarantine and, and the people looking after them. Unfortunately, it led to um, the escape of this into the general community and it's really affected mainly the uh, aged care sector and people who are looking after aged care people. So it's quite serious. We're in very much a very tight lockdown compared to other states where they're pretty well able to open up as churches now in most places, but we can't. Uh, and um, we haven't been able to for well, pretty well since March. So we are doing... Um, live stream and Zoom meetings, fellowship meetings and Sunday school and so on. Uh, it's not the same, of course, as being together, as you can understand that. But, but so we are in a serious uh, lockdown. If you're thinking in terms of the theological complexion of Australia, uh, it's more challenging. Um, we don't have that many reformed uh, denominations. Uh, the Sydney Anglicans are at least four point Calvinists and uh, uh, the Presbyterian Church of Australia uh, which 40 years ago um, lost many of its more liberal people into the uh, Uniting Church, which was formed then with the Methodists. Um, the Presbyterian Church of Australia is much more reformed and their college here in Melbourne, for example, is, is quite reformed. And uh, that's where I teach uh, or supervise students, uh, PhD students. Um, and our own little denomination is very small, but we've had our little influence anyway. Um, so, uh, we, we have a lot of spiritual need here. Reformed Baptists have not done so well in the past. I think there seems to be a resurgence of, of good quality uh, theological understanding. Hopefully that will work out also with a good relationship between the congregations, which is in the past has not worked terribly well. Um, uh, but I think there's a new day here and let's hope it uh, prospers. Yeah, 
Praise God. Uh, we'll be continue to praying in your church, uh, especially for you, Reverend, as you uh, minister to your church and as well uh, in your fellowship and also in your worship services. So we'll be praying for that, uh, Reverend. Thank you. Uh, and despite uh, also the denominations you know, and also Rev, uh, Reformed Baptist, uh, my guest in uh, one of our episodes is Joshua Grango uh, from Christ Covenant Church in Australia. And you've been one of their speakers and you've thought about the eldership. So I just want to ask, uh, how's the experience of a, a Reformed Presbyterian preaching in a Reformed Baptist church? <laughs> well, I suppose I would preach for the Pope if I was asked. <laughs> uh, so long as I had freedom uh, to preach the word of God, uh, then I don't mind where I preach. But um, I've got on very well with Josh and um, he does his live stream from our church building and, and the Lord's Day afternoons. And we've had a good relationship. And um, it's a pleasure to work with other Christians, even though we have differences on some matters. Uh, not every thing in scripture is equally important everything god reveals to us is important but not equally important and uh, obviously if you were trying to evangelize someone you probably wouldn't start with leviticus um, <laughs> but leviticus is important um, there are matters of first importance paul tells us in first corinthians 15 uh, christ uh, died for our sins according to the scriptures was buried i hope you've heard a sermon on the burial it's important um, and he rose from the dead the third day, according to the scriptures, and he appeared there. There's your fundamental basics. But um, everything's important. I keep everything in perspective. So I had a, 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 a pleasurable time. I enjoyed uh, the ministry on that occasion. Yeah, I see uh, you had a great time. And I also had a great time because I was one of the uh, uh, who attended in that service. And I really enjoyed how you preach the eldership really in a, uh, not only specific, but also being faithful to the word verse by verse. And I uh, really uh, praise God for your preaching on that about the eldership. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, now, uh, Reverend, we will now uh, proceed to the main questions, which is our topic for tonight, which is the Westminster Confession of Faith. And I believe that uh, Presbyterians hold dearly to this confession. And I was also inspired by this by Reverend James Briner Chu. If you're watching, hello. <laughs> Uh, he inspired me and he uh, motivated me to uh, challenge, also challenge me to read and also review uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith. So here is the first question, Reverend. Uh, when was the Westminster Confession of Faith written and what was the situation in that time? Well, the Westminster Confession is one of the major productions of the Westminster Assembly of Divines. That's the old word for theologians. So this Westminster Assembly, so-called because it met at Westminster in London, um, was called um, and began its work in 1643. And it continued its work actually until 1653, although its key work of producing documents that are associated with it begins in 1643 and ends in 1648. So that's the key period. And... Uh, uh, the key documents were, were a directory for public worship. Uh, then there was uh, a, um, a, a similar sort of a guide for the government of the church. And then came the Westminster Confession. And following that, the shorter and larger catechisms. So the Westminster Confession, to answer your question strictly, was um, written in 1646 concluded really at the end of 1646, although there were various um, hindrances to its final um, publication because the parliament wanted scripture texts that illustrated um, the doctrine stated to be added and they, they were added. So 1646, 1647 is the Westminster Confession. Um, and the Westminster Confession is, is of course very important. Presbyterians do in fact um, pay some attention to it. Even the liberal denominations still know what it is, but usually they are not taking it seriously. Um, it's historic for them and uh, interesting, no doubt. But um, for conservative denominations that take this, uh, t they do take it seriously. And in my own denomination, we hold to the whole teaching of the Westminster Confession. Uh, with one or two small ex uh, explanations, which were made actually at the time, 
it was adopted in Scotland in 1647 because they did say well, it was one of two things we need to clarify and they did that. Um, so we take it very seriously. Well, what were the circumstances of producing this uh, famous document? Uh, well, it might surprise uh, your hearers to realize that it was produced during wartime because in fact, that was the situation. Um, the church, you have to remember too, that England and Scotland and Ireland were separate kingdoms at this time. Um, they actually had the same monarch, but they were actually separate kingdoms. And of course, the king of England in the 16th century, Henry VIII, uh, had a problem because he wanted uh, someone who would be his heir, who would succeed him as king, but he only had daughters. Uh, the first one was Mary, and the second one was, um, dear me, I've just forgot, Elizabeth. And uh, then after a few divorces and things like this, uh, he got a son who became Edward VI. Now, Henry broke with Rome because he couldn't get the divorce from the king, uh, from the Pope at least, who normally would readily do this, but there were complications for the Pope because of other relationships. So Henry VIII broke with the, uh, uh, with the Pope, but he still remained a Catholic. But this was a time in the 1530s uh, when Re Reformation teaching was coming in. And so um, with people like Archbishop Cranmer, um, who was interested in reform and moving along that way and so on. And then with the death of Henry, uh, Edward was only nine years of age, but he became the monarch and he was a godly little man, little prince. And though he didn't last long on the throne because he died um, of about what eight or 10 years later, um, he, along with Cranmer, moved along the Reformation principles. But then when he died, who was going to take over? It was in fact Mary, the, uh, the oldest child. Um, Henry, of course, didn't want a woman to succeed because a woman would need to marry and she might marry someone who lived on, in Europe. And then that whoever she married would probably then take over and start ruling in England. And he didn't like that idea. So anyway, Mary takes over and she is a persecutor. She's Roman Catholic and she's a persecutor. Uh, but she, and she dies and Elizabeth takes over. This is Elizabeth I. And this is, uh, and she continues the reform. Uh, she continues to maintain the reform movement opposed to Catholicism, but she will not do all that everyone in the community, a lot of people wanted. Uh, she didn't want to go the Puritan way. She wanted to sort of stop. And that's why the church in England, whilst it was reformed in its doctrine um, and through the 39 articles of religion, well, it was actually a few more than that originally, 41, uh, it was reformed in its doctrine, but it didn't reform its government. And it kept bishops and all the paraphernalia associated with that. So Elizabeth dies. And who's going to succeed? Well, it actually was a man who was already King of Scotland, uh, James VI of Scotland. He becomes James I of England. This is complicated, isn't it? Uh, and he was a, quite a scholarly man. He didn't really like the Puritans too much. Uh, he, he didn't like Presbyterianism too much because it was a bit of a problem controlling Presbyterian assemblies. It was easy to control a few bishops, the appointment of a few bishops and an archbishop through those few people you can control the church. And he, that's what he wanted to do. But he was reasonably sensible. Uh, but he died in 1625 and Charles I became king. And Charles was a, a very foolish uh, sort of king. Uh, and uh, uh, concerns about Catholicism were coming back in here. He was very unwise in the way he handled things. Um, he appointed uh, an Archbishop of Canterbury called William Lord, L-A-U-D, who was basically sort of uh, not really sympathetic to uh, reform teaching, more Arminian. And he had this idea, you had to have absolute agreement in liturgy. Everything had to be done exactly according to the book. And he laid down the law in that. Then he tried to do the same in Scotland. And the Scots, uh, who were Presbyterian and had been since 1560, uh, they didn't like this at all. And so in 1638, there was a big uproar and that led to um, a lot of problems. There were wars, a uh, number of wars. We just generally call it the English Civil War, but there were a number of wars connected with this because 
the king in England, in Charles, who's also king of, of Scotland, he tries to impose on the Scottish church through Arch, the archbishop, his idea of running the church through a few bishops. And this led to a great concern. Also in England, uh, the Puritans have become much more uh, influential. The parliament is, is dominated, uh, the lower house of commons is dominated by Puritans, mainly at this point Presbyterians, but in increasingly, um, as the 1640s goes on, it becomes more independence. Uh, that is people who were reformed, but they thought each congregation was sufficient in itself and they didn't want any overarching control beyond the congregation. So it's in this kind of situation that uh, the, the church in England is in a mess. Its worship is all over the place. Uh, its government is broken down and everything's in disarray. And uh, the king uh, needs money uh, to pay, pay the Scots because of one of these wars. He goes to parliament because he's run out of money and the parliament refuses to give him the money um, unless, and I'm simplifying here, unless he agrees to uh, bring about reform in the church in England. And so the Westminster Assembly arises because of this. And uh, uh, the Westminster Assembly meets and begins on the 1st of July, 1643. And it begins just revising the, the doctrinal position of the church in England, the 39 articles as we call them today. Uh, and it just does that for a few months, but the situation is changing between the parliament and the king in England. And so, the Scots are called upon to help the English. And the Scots say, yes, we'll help you, but you have to reform the church thoroughly. So not only in worship and, and, and the government of the church, but you've got to bring everything into line with the word of God and the example of the best reformed churches. So that's the kind of, in a long way, winded way of explaining what's happening. Uh, so the Westminster Assembly now moves into the phase where it's, working on producing the documents I referred to before. And uh, the aim is to produce something that the three kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland, this will be the basis for a thoroughly reformed church in the British Isles. And the, the government, uh, the parliament is behind this. It convenes this assembly and tells the men that they gather together to get on with the job. There's about 120 people appointed, some from each count, county and so on, and um, uh, normally only about 60 or 10. And there are also these treaty commissioners from uh, Scotland, including people like Samuel Rutherford, famous man, and George Gillespie, young man, a very able man. And they come together and the Scots are able to sit in on all the committees and advise and so forth. But um, they have a lot of debate and it's not just on worship and government, um, as we used to think that uh, government was the big issue. It was also on doctrine. And they really go through thoroughly and uh, drawing also from what they've already done in the first few months before the, the Scots come in and, 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 and so on. Uh, they, they, they draw on what they've done on revising the 39 articles and they set out the Westminster Confession of Faith. And they take a lot of time in this. There's lots of debates and uh, they come out up in the end with what we know as the Westminster Confession of Faith. So the times were troubled. If you wanted to go down to London, you might have to go through areas where there's warfare and battles going on. It was a troubled time. Uh, people don't realize that. And 10% of the male population, adult male population died in the English civil wars. It was a major thing, a bit like the American civil war um, later on. So it's troubled times, but they're godly men who meet together and they're seeking to provide for the, the, the whole nation or the three kingdoms that formed the United Kingdom today, um, they were seeking to provide a thorough biblical foundation and they would admit nothing into their consideration except what was founded on the word of God. That was the whole argument. So that's a long-winded way of explaining how that all came about. I hope you can follow some of that. <laughs> yeah, praise God for uh, realizing or learning that uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith was written during a war. And... Um, and, uh, and not only that they want to um, stand up against the government, but also in doctrine. And I praise God for that, that um, we have faithful um, ministers that, who are passionate not only um, not being reformed, but at the same time, 
uh, being faithful to doctrine, to scriptures, and uh, it's a very uh, commendable and honorable thing, and it's passed down until today. And um, and you are one of the people, Reverend, that who is passionate in uh, uh, giving webinars, lectures, and even studies about uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith. And um, it's a it, it's it's a blessing that uh, it's been passed down through generations, and because. Uh, we believe that doctrine matters, and doctrine will help us uh, be not only be good Christians, but be good citizens, be uh, uh, good parents, uh, good parenting. We can do that, and even a responsible citizen, a responsible a Christian, a responsible pastor, a, a good uh, church member. So um, the Westminster Confession of Faith would help us to understand more the doc, the doc, the doctrine, which is the word of God, so I praise God for uh, what the, the the confessions went through, and it was bloodshed. It, it was a dangerous time to, uh, especially uh, uh, write a confession of faith that is different from the government. So it's a really uh, uh, a really honorable thing that we have these truths and confessions today, and praise God for your uh, for that wonderful answer, Reverend. Um, uh, I, I, I'm really listening to that part now. Uh, I really enjoyed your, your explanation towards the confession. I really, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and um, yeah, so as we are talking about the confession of faith, uh, um, I, I know the listeners, if you have any uh, comments or learnings, you can uh, post it on uh, our page or you can comment it on our premiere video or you can message us if you have any concerns. Uh, since we are talking about the confession of faith, Reverend, I believe that uh, it's also uh, great to know the contents of the confession. Uh, so what's, what are the things that they corrected or the things that they debated? So the question now is, can you give us a brief introduction, a brief introduction to the contents of, the, of this confession? Right. Well, uh, um, first of all, it's a very orderly arrangement in the confession of faith. If you look at, say, the Scots Confession of 1560, it's not such... Uh, it, it, that was also in a time of conflict produced, but um, it's not as orderly and carefully arranged. It doesn't have the same level of technical precision that you find in the Westminster Confession. Um, but the Westminster Confession aims to set out, really, um, the whole range of um, important... Uh, uh, truths. It doesn't cover every detail of scripture. It doesn't give you an exposition of the Ten Commandments, for example. You'll find that, particularly in the larger catechism, a very valuable um, catechism, often neglected. Um, it doesn't go into um, a great deal of detail either about the church. There is a section on synods and councils, but um, that was in the form of church government that they produced. Um, so it concentrates on the great um, spiritual truths, the biblical truths, it starts off with the Bible. Now, not all confessions before this time did that. Um, the majority started off with God, but some did start uh, with the uh, doctrine of Scripture. And sometimes people make a big issue about this and say, oh, well, you know, you should start with God. Well, the point is, how do you know saving truths about God? How do you really know who God is? And so, the Westminster Confession begins with Scripture, um, and then it moves on to look at, um, at at God, and 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 also when it looks at that subject of God, it talks about who God is. But then it it talks about in the second paragraph in that chapter, it talks about God as triune, Amen. and of course, in a sense, you have to establish the unity of God or the 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 oneness of God before you start talking in terms of the Trinity. And again, people quibble sometimes and say, oh, well, you know, we should start off in another way. But th there's logic in the way they do this. And they set this out. So basically, God and after Scripture, it's God and his purposes that follow next, not man and his needs, but God and his purposes. So you, you read about God's eternal plan. You read about uh, creation and providence. Um, you read about um, how sin arises in the human race. You read about God's covenant uh, and you deal with um, 
Christ as the mediator in the wonderful eighth chapter of the confession. So these are, are the main uh, uh, issues that are dealt with, first of all. But then you have to talk in, about uh, having spoken about God and the provision of redemption in Christ and God's purpose and so forth. You've got to speak about how this uh, uh, the redemption that Christ has purchased, uh, how that actually works out. Um, and so there's a chapter, an important chapter on human freedom, uh, because we are free. God has ordained that we act freely. Amen. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a story I, I, I think I was reading the other day or mentioned the other day in a sermon I was preaching. Uh, if you want to know what God has determined, um, has God determined that I should talk to you? Well, I should just talk to you because I'm acting freely. God has ordained that. He didn't make me do it. I did it um, because God ordains that I act freely. Um, but he is also in charge and, 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 and uh, he knows all things as well. And the two things are not in conflict. Now, of course, when it comes, confession reminds us that we've lost the freedom to act contrary to our nature. Oh, we never really had, uh, well, let me rephrase that. The point is we have freedom, but does that mean that I can now do something that is truly good in the eyes of God? And the answer to that, of course, is no because I have a corrupt nature. Um, and it's out of that corrupt nature that the things I do um, partake of that character. I mean, you get fruit from, uh, uh, you, you get oranges from an orange tree, um, uh, but from a sinful heart, you only get sinful things, wrongly motivated. They may be in form, look good, but in fact, they're not motivated correctly and so on. So we don't have freedom to act contrary to our nature. And so, um, so God's grace is therefore a divine rescue operation. And the confession moves from this area of human freedom, where it talks about the different freedoms at different points. And in fact, reminds us of the perfect freedom in glory uh, from which we can't fall. And it moves on to the nature of grace. And the grace is the uh, working of God in his loving purpose to uh, transform and renew. So you've got the whole idea of regeneration, uh, justification through faith, uh, adoption, uh, a very important little section in the confessions. One of the, it's about the only confession that deals with adoption. It's only a paragraph. It's great. And some of the uh, theologians in the Southern States of America have perhaps given more attention to this than most have. There's some good work has been done on that in the 19th century and, and, and more recently too. So you've got sanctification as well, which is very important because at the time of the confession, there were lots of people who said, if you're saved by grace through faith, well, it doesn't really matter how you live. God's justified you. You can, you can be casual on that sort of thing. And that was a big issue at the time of the Westminster Assembly. Not only was Catholicism an issue, but antinomianism, that is uh, a, a disregard of the law of God for the believer. Mm. And so they're very careful in handling that. Uh, so they talk about God's grace and how it works out in justification, adoption and sanctification. Then they move on to our response to God's grace. And so you've got saving faith defined for us and set out. You've got repentance leading to life, which they stress should be preached. And it's often not preached. We preach faith, but we don't preach repentance. But they cover this very well. And they talk about good works. Of course, we believe in good works, but it can't put the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. And good works flow out of a new relationship. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't bring about that relationship. So the new relationship established uh, through faith, being brought into God's family as his dear children, then this new life that has been given to us issues in good works. And also we see the perseverance of the saints. They keep on keeping on. And then the question of assurance is dealt with. Yeah. Uh, a big problem for many people. Assurance is not of, so of the essence of faith that uh, you have to always be assured. Uh, they are very careful about this. Uh, I think probably Calvin thought assurance was of the essence of faith, uh, virtually, almost in reaction to the Roman view that you couldn't really be sure of anything. You just had to trust the church. Um, the, the thing is that it's not so of the essence of faith. You can go through times of difficulty and and, and, and uh, lack of assurance. But uh, they say some other things about how God sustains and keeps his people and so on. 
So there's your great uh, soteriological kind of emphasis there uh, in the, those sections. And I've gone through them in the order in which they in the confession. But then you get some practical things about the Christian life. What about uh, the law of God? What about Christian liberty? Uh, what about religious worship and the Sabbath day? Um, what about, is it lawful to take oaths in a court of law and vows? What about civil government? What about marriage and divorce? Now, some of those things you might think, well, should they be in a confession of faith? Um, you really have to worry about whether you can marry your, uh, you know, marriage and divorce. Is, uh, do you have to put it in there? Um, well, you could leave some of these things out, perhaps. But on the other hand, they give you a rounded out view of what the Christian life requires of us. Then you've got a section on the church, but it's not a detailed section. It doesn't talk in terms of uh, Baptist theology of, uh, of the church or independent theology of the church, even the Presbyterian theology of the church and the structure of the church. It talks about uh, the church and you can view the church uh, as God sees it or as man sees it. But it talks about the importance of the church and that ordinarily there's no salvation outside the church. That's again something neglected. Uh, in modern evangelical thought. The church doesn't really matter. I can stay at home. I'll be right. And so on. Well, no, don't forsake the gathering of yourself together. There's a structure for the church. There are elders you're, you're to be submissive to in the Lord and so on. Um, so they make a fair bit about that. They talk about the importance of the communion of saints. That's fellowship with other believers as God enables you. They talks about the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And it talks about uh, church discipline and it talks about sinners and councils, but only in a general way. So, and then finally, and perhaps it shouldn't be finally, but that's how they've structured it, and it's typical of confessions of this period, there's the Christian hope. And there the emphasis falls on the state of the dead and the resurrection, and the last judgment and the eternal state um, uh, concludes the confession. So you can see it's a comprehensive, well laid out, well thought through, well debated. Everything is debated. Um, we don't actually have a record of all the debates, um, but it's quite clear that the a large part, I think at least a quarter, maybe more than that, I think it's more than that, just can't remember the figure, of the percentage of the uh, discussion at the, at the Westminster Assembly is on theology. Mm. To get it right, to provide something that will last and endure. And at the same time as they're doing this, remember the confession is a consensus document. It's not going into all the bypaths, all the nice, interesting little bits that the theologians like to debate about when they're having coffee in midweek. Uh, it's giving you the great, uh, it's giving you the highway on which we can come together and work together. Uh, and that should be remembered. Uh, there's some flexibility, if you like, or there's some matters that uh, people, you know, they don't introduce every possibility and uh, a, a view. Um, they will come try and come to agreement uh, on a consensus and sometimes they deliberately framed it so each one can have their own sense where there's some area where legitimate reform people can disagree and that's important to recognize far too many people don't well that's a that's the survey what's in it praise god for the answer reverend um yeah i really enjoy what you <laughs> <laughs> what you've uh, explained uh, about the contents of the confession and uh, the the holistic view of the confession that uh, we that uh, as Christians, uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith again serves as a guide for us, also not only to interpret uh, doctrine if we cannot understand, but also a Christian living of how can we be uh, Christians that are that is faithful to the Word of God and to the Lord's command. I believe that the uh, Westminster is uh, one of their purposes to be faithful. And all of these men who wrote and fought for it uh, wanted to be faithful to the Lord. And so that's why confessions, especially as the Westminster, came into existence. And so we, now we duly appreciate uh, the people who wrote this before and also to the people now who are holding us, like uh, Reverend Ward here as our guest, uh, teaching us and giving us in a description of the contents of the confession. I really enjoyed uh, uh, your answer there, uh, Reverend, and also... Uh, our conversation as we go on to to our topic. Uh, and if you are a listener, if you're watching, and if you have any comments, you can comment below uh, your insights of what Reverend Roland Ward is saying uh, with us uh, tonight. 
I believe, uh, Reverend, this is a short uh, answer. I think you can give us a short answer to the third question, which is, what distinguishes the Westminster Confession of Faith from the previous and or other confessions that arose? Uh, actually, last time I had Josh uh, spoke about the London Baptist Confession of Faith. And he said one of the, uh, some of his answers about this, uh, the, distinct, the distinguishes from others. So how does the Westminster Confession, Confession of Faith distinguish uh, from other uh, confessions that arose, previous or latter? Well, I suppose you could look at this in a number of ways. Um, the Westminster Confession actually owes a great deal to Archbishop uh, James Usher, uh, who was the Archbishop of Amar in Ireland. He was Calvinistic. He was a moderate Episcopalian, but he was also a royalist. He was uh, nominated to the assembly, but he never attended because of his um, uh, royalist sympathies and the king wasn't in favor, you see of the Westminster Assembly. So he didn't attend, but he had a great influence. Uh, and he had in 1615 uh, issued what are called the Irish Articles. And they are very influential in the um, formation of the Westminster Confession. So there's, uh, it's not as if you've got an absolute breach uh, with the past. Um, there are many good confessions. Um, the advantage I think is that there is real technical pre precision in this uh, in the Westminster Confession. Um, for example, the Belgian Confession is basically the production of, of one man, um, and uh, it's a great confession. But things have de developed somewhat. In 1517, say, if you say the Reformation began then, which is a bit artificial, but we'll say that, um, then you've got, in the 1560s, you've got a number of famous confessions written, like the Scots Confession and the Belgic Confession. And, and of course, you've got catechisms as well, um, like the Heidelberg Catechism and, and so on. Now, there is nevertheless development. People are starting to think through this. Remember, this is a time of great difficulty for the church. Um, there's persecution on the part of the uh, authorities, um, particularly the Catholic authorities against the reforming movement and so on. But as things settle down somewhat, and, and as more and more people are thinking through these issues, because remember, it's not Calvin who invents the Reformed faith. He's a great exponent of, of Presbyterianism and of the Reformed faith, no doubt. But there are lots of people working away here. And uh, in fact, in the Westminster Assembly, Calvin is not the most quoted person. I think Beza is, and then Augustine, something like that. But at any rate, um, you think through things. Now, towards the end of the 16th century, we'll say in the 1580s, people are starting to think through theologically some of the scriptures and the implications of them. So the big distinctive, I'd say, about the Westminster Confession is that it comes to a much more developed view of the original relationship of man, God and man in terms of covenant theology. And so it's, it's really quite distinctive. Uh, so a guy called Robert Rollock in the 1590s is very um, influential in this, uh, but it becomes a general kind of approach. Instead of thinking of sin being transmitted um, uh, sort of almost, uh, sh shall we say, by ordinary uh, generation, there's the idea of the imputation of Adam's sin to the, his posterity that comes much more to the fore. And so you find in the Westminster Confession, which you don't find in, in say, the Belgian Confession in the same way, it's, in, it's sort of there, but it's not developed in the way it is in the Westminster Confession. So you've got very clearly um, the distinctive emphasis on covenant theology as an organizing principle uh, for the biblical material. Um, even then, of course, it's not that everything is fully worked out. Um, reformed uh, covenant theology was really still being worked through and there are in the Westminster standards themselves there are uh, there's scope for difference of viewpoint on certain issues uh, for example the covenant of redemption is distinct from the covenant made with Christ and so on uh, there are, uh, are areas there where they don't definitively lay down the law they talk about the first covenant with man that doesn't rule out the eternal covenant. They all believe in that, but they haven't structured it in terms of um, uh, an organized covenant uh, theology necessarily. Some had, but um, uh, 
uh, not everyone was there. So they leave some matters a little bit open. But that, I think, is distinctive. And you see that carried through in the Savoy uh, Declaration of Faith and Order in 1658 by the independents like John Owen and so on. And they make some small um, uh, adjustments. Some might even say they're improvements. Um, uh, but they, they are a bit more specific in one or two of these areas. And this, the same feature is found in the London Confession of 1677 and also the more formal one in um, 1689, the same thing really. Um, so that it's, it, 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 uh, even among those with quite different views of the nature of the church uh, and the membership of the church, uh, you've got a unity here, which is very, very striking. And of course, um, well, you understand this, but uh, there's, there's a great deal of agreement between these confessions, um, but there are also some distinctive differences and they're not unimportant differences. Some people make them too important. Um, some may not make them important enough, but, but um, that's the big distinctive and that's the co great contribution. So even in the, you, you'll see that covenant theology has a future and, and it has a continuing emphasis down the years, whereas in, say, the Dutch churches who hadn't got the same development and, under and grasp of covenant theology, even though their great theologians did, it wasn't in the confessions, and so it slipped away and, uh, and was lost, really, uh, for a considerable amount of time. So that, that's what I'd say is the great contribution of the Westminster Assembly, technical proficiency, um, but also a, a covenant structure. Wow. Uh, praise God uh, for, for that. Um... I believe um, the Westminster Confession of Faith serves as inspiration to other confessions uh, in the latter, which is one of those is the London Baptist Confession of Faith and other uh, confessions that arose because of the, what you've said, uh, Reverend, the, the, uh, the accuracy, the, the structure, uh, the, everything that's in the content. Because uh, if you look at the listeners, uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith is a holistic kind of a document uh, as what Reverend Roland Ward uh, Gave, gave us a second question, the contents. Uh, it serves as a big, big uh, chunk of document that we can reflect and also we can look upon to, to confess as a church and even as an individual uh, in your homes or even in your families. Uh, these, mm -hmm. the, the confession led to the catechisms and led to other uh, successful, uh, by God's grace, successful uh, church plants and we've seen uh, churches now in the Presbyterian community that they are faithful to the word of God. They are utmost uh, of respect and of the elders and the reverend and even uh, our professors. Uh, the Presbyterian community serves as a, I, I, I commend the, uh, the Presbyterian community because they have a high uh, amount of respect in terms of structure uh, that uh, they, 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 uh, they call people not uh, not just by simply picking them because they have a potential, but they also uh, been tested. And I believe, uh, Reverend Ward, uh, if if I can uh, emphasize the presbytery or the eldership, and also the documents of the Confession of Faith, I would remember First Timothy, uh, the the Timothy Scriptures, because it always emphasizes the eldership, just like we, we preached when I was there, and also the qualifications of an elder and a deacon. And uh, when, I, when I hear these verses, I always remember ah, the, the Westminster, the Westminster. So it serves as a reminder for me that uh, uh, the Westminster is also inspired, is inspired by the word of God, that uh, they just wanted to be faithful uh, to the people in the community to, to learn more about God through these confessions. And through that, we can confess together as a church. Do you have anything to say, Reverend? Yes, I, I just make this point. Um, just because the confession is so great as the high watermark, as is often said, of uh, confession writing, uh, creates a danger for us that, that we can give it a place uh, higher than it ought to have. Now, it's important, and, and without going into the whole history of subscribing to the confession, it's important to remember that we subscribe to the teaching not to the words necessarily. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some parts of the confession, some places in the confession where you'd say, oh, I'd, I'd express that a little bit differently. I don't think they've quite caught it there when it talks about, you know, uh, 
for example, in the, in the conflict in the believer and the regenerate part and so forth. It uses language like that and as if there's almost uh, two men, it, 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 whereas there's one man who also sins, one new man who also sins, which is so contradictory and so wrong, but yet that's the reality. Sometimes you think, oh, they could have expressed that a little bit differently. Well, they're not trying to be exhaustive. Um, they're not trying to say everything. It's the doctrine. It's the teaching conveyed by the words that you adhere to. So that's why I've been quite happy to carefully and conservatively modernise language because these guys were, they were, they, the language of scholars in those days was Latin. And they, they are very good at constructing things very precisely. But when we read today, sometimes we can misunderstand and not appreciate. So I do think it's important to recognise, yes, it's a great confession, but let's not make it scripture. In fact, the first use of a confession is to remind us that scripture is our supreme standard. But on the other hand, we need a confession because uh, we need a rallying point. We need to be uh, in the course of history, people would say, oh, well, Jesus is, 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 is Lord, but then that doesn't mean this. It means that. So you get errors arising. And so you have to state what you believe scripture teaches. Everyone says they believe the Bible, yeah. um, but uh, it's a Bible correctly interpreted. And so in the course of history, various issues have been raised and the church has looked at this and, and, and established various points. The, the church of God did not begin in, with Luther in 1517. <coughs> we have no problem with the looking back right into the past and the men who wrote the Westminster Confession were very good at that, as was Calvin, for example, as well. But we, we need to just remember the Confession is a great gift of God. Um, it's a rallying point for believers. It's not a means of, of, of anathematizing everyone else, yeah. um, but it's a means of saying this is how we believe Scripture to teach. And if we think we don't need a confession, we just need the Scriptures. It reminds me of when I was young, and I'll finish here, when I was a lot younger, I went along to a group uh, which just called itself um, Bible-only church. Mm. But if you raise, for example, you won't mind me using this illustration because I did raise it, raise it with them, that um, infant baptism, you've soon found that they had a certain view on infant baptism. Even though they had no written creed, they had a certain view about it. Now, Presbyterians like to be honest and say, this is what we think is the situation, you see. Um, we don't want to anathematize everyone who disagrees with us, but this is what we believe scripture teaches. But churches that say Bible only, they don't really mean Bible only. They mean my understanding of the Bible. They just don't write it down. Uh, or, or, and they don't try and blind you with, with this, the Bible only. So if the Bible correctly interpreted, absolutely important to get hold of that. But the confession is not scripture, um, but it is a faithful uh, endeavor to faithfully represent scripture truth. Thank you for elaborating to us, uh, Reverend War, because, uh, well, um, we can be passionate uh, in studying the Westminster. We forget the main source, which is the word of God, the Bible, the, 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 the word of God that transformed us, the Bible that renewed our minds, the Bible that uh, uh, gave us the gospel. So listeners, uh, uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith and other confessions are really great but they are all inspired by the word of God. So the, the main source still is the word of God. So uh, let's not, I, we pray that the, the men's minister will not be a substitute for you not to look to scripture. And looking by, by looking scripture, you can also uh, see if the, the confessions are true, if the confessions are faithful to what the word of God says. So it's a, it's a challenge for all of us to uh, read his word because uh, that's that's the, coming out from the mouth of God, inspired and passed down to his uh, to the writers of the Scripture, and I really appreciate. Just uh, one, yeah. yeah, just one thing that just comes sure. to mind is certainly in our tradition, in the Presbyterian tradition, we don't we have there have been cases where it's been done, of course, but we don't generally impose the uh, or require ordinary members to subscribe the confession. Um, the admission into the Church of God. Uh, does not require you to um, sort of have gone to go to university, as it were. Uh, 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 faith in, in Christ, um, a, a, some basic understanding of the scriptures and faith in Christ and a life that uh, appears uh, consistent with that, that's the basis on which we in Presbyterian circles admit people to membership. But we do require the office bearers to subscribe the confession. Um, 
as a means of ensuring that the form of sound words is adhered to, that scripture is adhered to. So we don't impose it. And um, I've had Baptists in my congregation, it shows you how generous I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, um, it's important to recognize that we're all in the school of Christ and some maybe are in the, in the first grade, uh, but the Lord loves them and the Lord has drawn them to himself and uh, we are not to reject them. Uh, that's how I see it anyway. Praise God. Uh, yeah. Amen to the, we are all schools uh, in Christ. That, uh, uh, I believe, uh, I think John Piper would say that no one is a graduate of the gospel. So every one of us are, are uh, in, in, in the uh, student or in the school of Christ. Thank you so much, Reverend Ward, for sharing your time with us. It's an honor and a, and a pleasure to have you on our show. I hope that we can do this more often, especially, uh, uh, talking about the catechisms and the eldership, I, I plan to do that one soon, and I hope that we can uh, have you uh, uh, in the future shows, and uh, we can set a a wonderful time uh, for that. Uh, so the last question will be, Reverend, is what is your advice or encouragement to the listeners on why confessions matter, particularly the Westminster Confession of Faith? Well, probably already covered that actually in um, in the last uh, things that I was saying. Um, a confession you you have to have a a doctrinal basis for a church. Everyone has a doctrinal basis. Uh, it, what kind of basis have you got? One that um, some uh, individual has um, produced. It may be good, of course, but it's better if it's been done by a group of people. Um, so, in the meeting of minds, you can um, make sure you don't get give a wrong emphasis. It's very easy for people, especially in small groups, to um, exaggerate differences and make them too important. Um, when you've got a good number of people gathering together, you're more likely to avoid that. Um, the confession's very important in in a day when uh, so much emphasis is placed on on the individual and how they feel. That's all very well, but it's what God has done. The gospel is not about how I feel. The gospel is about what God has done in Jesus Christ. And unless you get that clear, um, you, you're going to have trouble. Um, you probably have trouble anyway, as we see in the New Testament church, because of, of the sin of men and how even the clearest things can be perverted. But uh, you can't really get anything better uh, in many ways than the Westminster Confession. I'm not wanting to say it can never be superseded or something. It's really just the doctrines there. It's, it's first of all, it's, it's Catholic in the best sense. It's Trinitarian. Um, it's Protestant in the emphasis on, on the word of God as the source of our teaching, not uh, unwritten traditions and, and so forth, as Rome uh, does. It's uh, Calvinistic as well in its soteriology. Uh, and that's right, that it should have that. You're never going to be able to change those sort of things. Uh, you can restate them perhaps uh, sometimes in a little bit better language um, than this sort of English that was written in those, that period. But you do need something clear like this, and you could hardly go better, um, especially in an, uh, 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 as a group begins and, and it's growing from a small base. It gives you something that's ecumenical. Um, now, of course, if you're a Baptist, then you want to go for the 1689, perhaps until I persuaded you that after all, go back to 1647 <laughs> or something like that. But, but no, seriously, um, you need a good basis. I think Carl Truman's got a book called The Creedal Imperative, and that's exactly right. Uh, you all, everyone has beliefs. Let's unite together on beliefs that have been well thought through and, uh, and, and keep on that broad highway instead of getting off into ex areas where things are exaggerated and got out of proper balance. You've got a lot of value and help in the, in the Westminster Confession and the things that have derived from it. Don't worry, uh, Reverend. Uh, I'm, I'm currently attending in the Presbyterian Church. So <laughs> I'm one of those uh, uh, subscribing to a Baptist Confession but in a Presbyterian Church. <laughs> You could do worse. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, uh, Reverend Roland Ward, for being on the show. Uh, it's truly an honor and a, and a pleasure to have you. Uh, I hope that we can do a lot of episodes soon with you. Um, and uh, uh, may God bless you and uh, praying for your church and praying for your community as well in Australia. Thank you very much. God stay, bless. Stay tuned for more episodes. We will be having uh, next week, we will be having Pastor Franco Ferrer. 
uh, a, a founder of the I Disciple Philippines, and we will be talking about discipleship in a pandemic. Stay tuned for more episodes of the Faith Library, and you can also watch us on Facebook. And also on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. It is Faith Library PH, and we will upload the videos from Joshua Gurango, from Pastor Conley Owens, Joel Sedekes, and tonight with Reverend Dr. Roland Ward. Stay tuned for more episodes. See you all, and God bless. God bless. <laughs>